Hi, I'm Norm Miller. All of us at Interstate Battery want to thank you for your business and wish you and your families a very Merry Christmas and a great New Year. To help you enjoy the holidays, I'd like to introduce Joe Gibbs, the owner of our Winston Cup race team and three-time Super Bowl winning coach of the Washington Redskins. And more importantly now, he's become a dear friend. I hope you enjoy Joe's life story and how his faith has carried him to levels he never dreamed of. Here's Joe. God bless you and have a Merry Christmas. He has been called the finest coach in NFL history. And the facts and figures seem to back it up. In 12 years as head coach of the Washington Redskins, Joe Gibbs totaled 140 victories, three Super Bowl championships, four NFC championships, and five division titles, with a winning percentage of nearly 700. He won at least 10 games in a season eight times and earned eight playoff berths, making the Redskins the most successful franchise in the NFL during the 1980s and 90s. Joe Gibbs is one of just 19 coaches in NFL history to win 100 games, with only six achieving the feat faster. He has set a standard of excellence in the postseason. His near 800 winning percentage in the playoffs has placed him in the top five coaches of all time. Only four other coaches have taken their teams to at least four Super Bowls as Gibbs has. National publications and pro football experts alike have hailed him as the greatest coach of all time. Just win with, hey, win with style, man. Win with style. Great job, man. Proud of all of you. Proud of all of you, man. In his new career on the NASCAR circuit, Joe has become one of the most successful owners in racing winning that sports version of the Super Bowl, the Daytona 500, in only his second year. But it has been said the true measure of a man's success is not based on numbers, but rather in the legacy he leaves in the lives of those he touches. Perhaps it is in that area that Joe Gibbs has made an even more valuable contribution. His life has become an example to those around him and demonstrated what has given Joe Gibbs the winning edge. The principles that drive Joe Gibbs' life are rooted in his deep faith in God, a faith that strengthens him, sustains him, and motivates him. In this video, Joe Gibbs will take you inside his life as one of the most successful coaches in the National Football League and share his personal triumphs and struggles. He'll also discuss the challenges that have come with being a husband, father, and businessman. More than a football coach and racing team owner, Joe Gibbs is a man who has gained unique insight through his experience. Insight that has given him a winning edge. Shot! Yellow 41! Yellow 41! Hunt, hunt! There's the snap, and the ribbon's good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone! The 35, the 30, the 20. He's gone! He's gone! Many people ask me, I'm always, I'm always interested, they say, Joe, how would you get to be the head coach of the Washington Redskins? And, you know, it's not like you get a PhD in coaching or something, and uh, I have to tell them, I don't know. <laughs> I wound up in San Diego State, and I got to be about a junior or senior out there, and I said, well, what do I like to do? I'm, I, I kid um, my mother all the time. I said, well, I was trying to make up my mind. Do I want to be a neurosurgeon, a physicist, or a football coach? And I said, ah, what the heck, I'll be a football coach. <laughs> and. Uh, but I, but I got on that uh, uh, staff there at San Diego State coaching. And uh, when I got through, I wasn't good enough to play pro sports. And uh, I'll tell you a little trivia question for all the sports fans here. That original coaching staff at San Diego State had a guy on it by the name of Don Coriel, who went on to coach in pro ball at two different places, did a fantastic job. Some people may, rate him maybe the best ever. And another guy by the name of John Madden. That's who I worked under. I uh, went in and volunteered for that job, and I said, hey, I'll work for nothing. That's how I got started coaching, and my job, really, the most important job I had was on, uh, at night, was to go over to the local jack-in-the-box and get the tacos and the hamburgers and bring them back, and the only time I really got in trouble is if I left something off John Madden's taco, I was in trouble. <laughs> I wind up uh, moving on and coaching a bunch of places and uh, of all things get an opportunity to go to the Washington Redskins to coach their football team there as a head coach and can you believe it I go the dream that I'm getting to live to go there and coach and do you realize I started out 0-5. Now 0-5 in Washington is a big deal. <laughs> 
Uh, I was just looking for different ways home at night. I didn't want anybody to know where I was. I told Pat, please get rid of the dog because there's no telling what's going to happen. Uh, but of all things, we got that thing turned around, got to go to some Super Bowls, and uh, I tell you, it was one of the greatest uh, experiences anyone could ever have. Of all things, I had a dream about getting in auto racing, and uh, you know, I, I had one big challenge there, and that was to talk my wife, who could care less about auto racing, into coming in and spending some money on race cars. And uh, they said, okay, I'll tell you what, bring her to Charlotte. We got a beautiful racetrack there, and they got these $250,000 suites. We'll put her up in one of the suites. I get somebody to put her up there, we'll get a lot of food, people to talk to. There's gonna be three races in this particular race. You won't get bored. I said, man, that's great. What a great game plan. Sure enough, Turned out perfect. The day was just right. The people, the box, everything is great. I got Pat up there <laughs> trying to persuade her and all this stuff. And we got down and this first race starts. 20 laps into the first race, I looked over and Pat was like this. She is totally asleep. I, I, I know I'm in trouble. I said, good gosh, what am I going to do here? I kept talking and I got my two sons to talk and we eventually persuaded my wife to make an investment in, our, in a race car team. Now our first race I got to tell you, in NASCAR, they start off with the Super Bowl. And our first race was the Daytona 500 two years ago. And our car started 31st in this race because we'd gotten a wreck qualifying. And so we're way at the back. Well, they said Pat's up in this box now. She's got money in this car. And they said every time that car came by, she was just like this. She's on her toes and she's watching her money go by. And uh, <laughs> we started 31st. It, the, we go right to the front. If any of you were watching that race that day, we went right to the front. We're seventh after 200 miles. And they said, Pat's up there, and she's going, this is a piece of cake. We're going to win our very first race. There's no, this, is no, this is not even a big deal. And uh, for the race fans also, you'll know in that particular race, at about 350 miles, three cars decide to go abreast on the back straightaway, and there's a 14-car wreck. And guess whose car is right in the middle of it? Our car gets tore all to pieces. It's the only one that we've ever lost. And now I am in the back. I'm all dejected and everything with everybody back there, the driver and everything. And so now I said, well, I better go find Pat. I went to the box. She wasn't in the box. They went, said she left, man. She went to the mobile home. I went, oh, no. I beat it down to the mobile home. I go inside. There's Pat laying on the bed in the mobile home. She looks up at me, and the first thing she said was, I don't think I like this. <laughs> and the second thing she said, how much did that cost? <laughs> I told her, no problem, it's in the budget. But we've uh, somehow managed to survive two years of racing. We love that. Uh, my one son's working there. We're having a ball with that. Pat doesn't quite understand that, though, either. JD, my one son that's working in racing, he always wanted to get in racing. And uh, five years of college, and he's uh, uh, changing left side tires on race day. Pat goes, five years of college, and he's changing tires? What's the deal there? <laughs> Grew up in uh, the hills of North Carolina. My grandmother and mother, man, had me in church. It wasn't this big, pastor, but it was a little church there. And I was one of the kids that played there. You know, threw the stuff out of the stairs on you guys and stuff like that. But my grandmother and mother made sure I was in that church. And uh, I can remember some of the first big decisions I ever had to make in life because in school, I was being taught that two amoeba happened to hit in a muddy puddle of water a couple of million years ago, and we evolved into man and woman. Or I was being taught in my church by my pastor and my grandmother and at Bible school and what have you that, no, that wasn't the case at all. That God looked down and loved me, made me special, and put me on this earth with special abilities. Could that be an accident? Think about it. Uh, I, sometimes I use uh, my watch as an example. You know, uh, people want proof. Well, I, I, I tell you something. I'm not real smart, but I know this is a complicated piece of machinery here. And I know that where there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. I can figure that out. And I'll tell you what, you look at this world and the way this thing is put together. I'll tell you what, I looked at that and I said, hey, listen, I, I, I'm not real sharp, but I know this. Where there's a world, there's a world maker. And I tell you what, I think that is real proof. If you want proof, 
This book, written by 35 authors over a period of 1,500 years, and so far, everything from the beginning to the end has been perfect. You stop and think about it. You know how hard that is? I'll tell you how hard it is. <laughs> I went to Tampa Bay Buccaneers in about 1974 to be the offensive coordinator down there. Now, in football language now, offensive coordinators are the guys that make the calls on the sidelines, you know, and I went down there and I was so excited because, man, I wanted to be a head coach and I knew my next step up was going to be being a head coach as soon as I went down there and put the Tampa Bay Bucks in the Super Bowl. So I I'd made up my mind that's what I was going to do. And I went down there and the first thing that the head coach down there, John McKay, asked me to do, he says, Joe, why don't you go out and work out the quarterbacks? I said, okay. I went out and did that and I came back in. He says, what do you think? And I said, uh, I don't think we have one. <laughs> And he goes, I agree with you. I don't think we do either, so let's go try and find one. We went out and worked out some quarterbacks this year, and we came across a guy by the name of Doug Williams. How many remember Doug Williams? Man, we drafted that guy in the first round. I was all set. I'm on the sidelines, and I'm calling plays. And you've seen the way the guy signals on the sideline. Well, we kind of developed that, and that's the way I was calling plays to Doug. It was a short, quick way to get things into the quarterback. And, man, we took off, and we won a game or two, and then we lost a couple of games. And Coach McKay came to him, and he said, Joe, he said, listen, I'm not real comfortable with you using those signals. I want to know what your plays you're calling, so I want you to tell a player on the sideline who will go in and tell Doug Williams who will tell the team. Now, have you ever tried calling a, a play? And this is one of our plays right here. Trips right, zoom, Liz, 989, F cross snake. <laughs> now, you want to try and call that to a receiver that's been hit in the head about three times that's going to go in and tell Doug Williams. You know what I mean? They look at you like, and they go in, and Doug looks back and goes, what was that? And uh, we call the play. And I'm here to tell you that uh, we went about another two games, and we lost another couple. <laughs> and Coach McKay came to me, and he said, listen, Joe, I figured this out. He said, I don't think you're real comfortable on the sideline, so I want you to go up in the press box where you're used to calling those plays, and you've been other places. You call the play down to an assistant coach on the sideline who te will tell a player on the sideline who will go in and tell Doug Williams who will tell the team. Do you realize a lot of people call plays that way? What's wrong with that? It's just like in the party where you pass the sentence around the room, and when you get to the other side, what? Hey, it's never, it's never the sentence. That's too complicated. That's too hard to do. Stop and think about it. 35 men over a period of 1,500 years. Now, how hard's that? What's that tell you? This book is a miracle. This book was put here by God. This book is our game plan. Hey, when you go to play a game, man, I tell you, you got to have a game plan. Don't you? We, we go to play a game, we, we know what we're going to try and do. We got about seven running plays. We got about 12 passing plays on first down, and we know what we're going after. Hey, this book's our game plan. If you want to study the way to succeed in life, God left this for us, and this book is a miracle. 50,000 people screaming, We want Dallas. Play action fakes to Dorset. Hit the ball well. Set up a screen, batted in the air, picked off by Darrell Grant. Touchdown, Washington Redskins! I don't believe it! Unbelievable! When I came out of college, and man, I tell you, I'm probably like a lot of you guys, I wanted to be happy and successful. And so I took off on this journey, and man, I tell you, all of a sudden I started seeing that there was a game plan out there. And where was, it was a, a world's game plan. And the world's game plan is sold to us where? In the papers, and it's in the magazines, and it's in the movies, and it's on TV. And, and I started seeing that there was a game plan out there. Man, it said, listen, if you want to be happy and successful, here's what you have to do. And the first thing is you got to make money, gain position if you can, hopefully become a position of power in some ways, and in my case, win football games. If you do enough of that, you're going to be happy and successful. The second thing that the world kind of tells us is that it loves us. The world says, man, I love you. Now, if there's anybody who can talk to you about that, it's a football coach. Because I've heard you guys on fourth and one. What do you all say? Go for it, go for it. When I was a young coach, I went, man, they want to go for it. And the first time I went for it and didn't make it, you all went, boo. But a football can a coach can tell you now, well, what, does the world love you or not? 1983, we probably had one of the best football teams I think that's ever been, uh, ever played in the NFL. We were 14 and two with two one-point losses. Man, we had John Riggins at fullback. We had Joe Theismann at quarterback. We had a defense that was rock solid. And I'm telling you, we were pretty good. 
And uh, we were going to the Super Bowl in 1983, and we're going to play, uh, play the Raiders in Tampa. And I'll tell you what, uh, I went down there, and I'll tell you about that time. Here I was, a PE major from San Diego State, who was coaching a football team that had gone to a couple of Super Bowls. I'm going to tell you, you know what? Everybody in Washington started saying I was pretty smart. Can you believe that? And the worst part of that is I started to believe them. And so <laughs> we go down to Tampa, and uh, we line up, and I was just sure we were going to beat the Raiders that day. And we took off in that game, and it was one of the, I mean, that first half was awful. We got a punt blocked, everything in the world. I, I see my Redskin guy here going, yeah, I saw that. It was awful. Uh, we took off. We started playing that game, and everything in the world went wrong. We fumbled the ball. We got a punt block and everything. And so it comes down to 12 seconds to go in the first half, and I was confronted with the decision. They had just punted to us, and the ball was all the way back on our 20-yard line, and the football bus here will tell you you can't throw a pass to the end zone 80 yards. And so I was confronted. Do I fall on this football? Or do I try and go for something? Now, I know how you guys all are. If I could have stopped the TV sets wherever you were, you would have said to me, because I've heard you in the stands, you would have said to me, are you crazy? Try it. Go for something. Take a chance. And so I'm on the sidelines. It's a little different for me. I'd like to have all of you down there with me sometimes. I got Joe Theismann yakking in this year. I got guys yelling and screaming on this year. So I said, shut up. Here's what we're going to do. Okay? Uh, we're going to take a shot. We had two timeouts left. We're going to try and throw a little screen pass here, try and pick up about 20 or 30 yards, get to midfield, call timeout, hopefully with a few seconds left, and throw a Hail Mary at the end zone. At least we got a chance. Makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, I, so I told Joe Theismann, that's what you're going to do. And Joe takes off in the ball game, and he goes in there, and he drops back. Now, when you're that far away from the goal line, I was here to tell you, nobody plays man-to-man -man defense, right? Everybody drops straight back. Well, one linebacker went man-to-man -to, -man to Joe Washington, who we were going to throw the screen pass to, and Joe Theismann goes back and throws the prettiest screen pass in the world to the Raider linebacker, who scored with it. Now, remember I was telling you I was a pretty smart guy in Washington? The next day in the Washington Post, I was called a buffoon. Now, that's a true story. What are you guys laughing about? It kind of hurt. You know what I mean? I say this to illustrate to you, if there's anything a football coach can tell you, uh -uh. the only way you can please the world is if you win right. every time. That's right. Now, if, if you're going to live by those standards and you're in business, you better make the deal every time. And you better not have any financial problems. Or you better not have any relationship problems. Because the world loves somebody that wins all the time. You know what I started discovering on the other side of that? That isn't that the case at all with God. God loves us more when we're having a tough time than when we're winning. See the difference? I had uh, just won a big football game there in Washington, and we were getting ready to go play the Dallas Cowboys in about 1984 for the divisional championship. And man, I tell you what, that day I was strutting around that house. You know, I got up that morning, yeah, we do guys, and we made the deal, and we won the football games, and we had a great sermon, you know. We, and God puts great, great women in our life, doesn't he? There's no right when he knock us down. And so I'm strutting around the house that morning, you know, getting ready to go to work, and uh, Pat said, uh, do you mind picking up your socks and your bathrobe? And I, I said, uh, I said, the nerve of her to tell such an important guy to do that. And uh, so I kept, you know, I kept around the house that day, and I keep going. I get ready to go to work, and then she started telling me something about the two boys, you know, this or that, and, and we'd, she'd had some problems with one of them, and then, you know, she was, and I said, what is the deal here? You know, I started getting agitated. What's she doing worrying me with this, something about my sons when I'm getting ready to go to work and try and win this big football game? And so I kind of stormed out of the house sometimes like we do, you know, and slammed the door, you know, and got in the car, and I kind of made a little promised to myself I'd try and pray each day on the way to work. And all of a sudden in that prayer time it came to me. And I tell you what, when I got to work, here's what I did. I called Pat back and I said, Pat, I want to tell you something. What you're taking care of at home is more important than what I'm taking care of at work. The most important thing I'm going to leave on this earth, you know what it is? It's not those football games. It's my two sons. And the influence that I've had on others. And man, I tell you, if there's anything that we need to have straighten up our mind is that. That's the only thing we're going to leave here, really, that amounts to anything. Art Love needs one. He's stacked out here.
to the near side. In motion to the far. Rippon is back, looking for Monk. On the out pattern, he's got it! says, man, if you can accomplish enough of these things, you're going to be happy and successful in life. And I wanted that. Probably, maybe like some of you out there. And so I took this game plan, man, I took off. And I come out of college and I am roaring. I'm trying to do all these things. And I kind of put God on the back shelf and I started living by this game plan. And of course, being happy and successful, if you accomplish enough of these things, I found out this. Every time I accomplished some of those things, won games, went to Super Bowls, went to Rose Bowls, made some money and all that, I still had an emptiness inside me. And you know why? You know why I had that emptiness? I started discovering in 1972 that God had made me, and he had put that void there, and it didn't matter how much money I tried to put in there, how many football games I tried to win, I still had that empty feeling inside of me. Yes. Maybe some of you have had that. Yes. Because God made us. He made us with that empty feeling because he made us for a personal relationship with each one of us. That's the only thing that can feel that. And so you see what had happened to me is sin over that period of time, about 16 years, it kind of separated me from God. But you know the great thing about that is God has a solution to that. You know what his solution to sin is? Is Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with him. And I'll tell you, uh, John 10.10 10 tells us, I'm come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I started discovering that this game plan, the world's game plan, hey, I wasn't, I wasn't having an abundant life. I needed to start following God's game plan. So in 1972, one night in church, I got up and I went forward and here's what I said. God, I've known you were there ever since I was nine years old, but I've not been living for you, and tonight I want to re rededicate my life and commit my life to you. He'll hand off to Smith, and he's back. Good hole, midfield, horse race to the 40, far side 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Washington Redskins, Timmy Smith from 58 yards career is important to guys and gals and we all want to be successful in our fields and like I told you I had uh, wanted to be a head coach man I made up my mind that's what I wanted man and sometimes I wanted that more than the other things more than God more than my family man I had that thing up here and I was going after it well I went down to Tampa Bay like I said and I went down there to be the offensive coordinator and I just knew that was gonna be the next step for me to being a head coach well, I went down there, and that season that I was just telling you about, man, that thing started off pretty good, and all of a sudden, it went to pieces. And we wound up 4-12 uh, and 12 that year. And when I finished that season, I could hold my hand out literally and shake like a leaf. I mean, that thing just fell apart. And the whole time, I'm going, why? Why, Lord? Why are you doing it? See, every program I'd ever been in, I'd been successful. All of a sudden, now I'm losing, and I'm saying, why? Why did this happen to me? Maybe some of you have had experiences like that in your your career. Well, Don Coriel, that other coach that I had, had just got the job with the Chargers. And I prayed a prayer. I said, God, don't have him call me unless you want me to go. The next day, Don Coriel called me and he offered me a job. The only problem was this job was not being the offensive coordinator. I was going to have to back up in my career. I was going to go back to just being a backfield coach and work under another assistant coach. Man, that pride and stuff, that bothered me. And so, uh, but I took the job, prayed about it and everything and took the job. But you know, I had no peace about that decision. And so I made up my mind, I was going to go see that little spiritual father of mine back in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I got on a plane and there weren't even any players there to work out that year, but I was going anyway. And uh, we took off and that plane got, if you've ever been to Fayetteville, Arkansas, you got to kind of dive over the mountains. Any of you ever been there? And this little plane started over the mountains, but it was snowing that day and we had to divert the landing. And we went back and landed in another little town south of there called Fort Smith. And man, again, I'm going, why, God? Why are you doing this to me? And questioning God all the time. And so I got back to Fort Smith, and I said, I'm still going to fail. Well, I grabbed my bags, and I went out front, and there was just two little guys out there, uh, uh, renting a car, and I heard them say they're going to drive to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I went over and I said, are you guys going to Fayetteville? And they said, yeah. And I said, I'm going with you. I opened the back door and just threw my bags in there. 
These two guys are looking at each other, and we get in the car, they start down the road, and they are all over the place. They, they, this snow is starting to accumulate, and I can tell these guys aren't making it. And uh, we get about two miles down the road on this freeway, and I said, uh, hey, pull over and let me out. And I think they were glad to. Uh, they pulled over. I got out on that freeway, took my bags, and I went across and climbed across the center divider in the freeway. I went on the other side, and I hitchhiked my way back to Fort Smith. I went in there, and I got my flight. I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to Fayetteville. And again, I'm just really down, questioning God all the time. And I went over and sat down in the airport in Fort Smith. And I sat in there kind of praying, and I looked over, and there was a Bible sitting in the airport there. How many of you have ever seen a Bible in the airport? Not many. And I picked this Bible up, and I turned it to the first chapter of James, because that's the chapter I kind of claimed on making decisions and this career and everything. And so without me saying a word, a young guy about my age tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, I claimed that verse and those verses right there in that chapter in my life about six months ago. And I said, really? Without me saying anything else, this guy rattled off a story that paralleled mine almost exactly. He had had a job, one he always wanted, lost it, and was trying to get it back, and God had given it back. Now, the world would tell us, well, that's just a coincidence. That Bible just happened to be there. This guy just happened to tap me on the shoulder. Are you kidding? That's like the two amoeba in a puddle of water. I mean, that, 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 that's not an accident. Man, I, I, I look at it this way. God either put that guy there or that, that was an angel. That's the way I look at it. I got up, wrote his name down in my Bible, and I ran and jumped on that plane, and here's what I said. I said, God, I've been wanting to be a football coach all this time and a head football coach, but I'm going to leave that up to you from now on. You've convinced me. I'm putting my career in your hands. I went to San Diego. Two weeks after I was there, the guys who had the job that I was going to be working under got another head coaching job. Don Coriel called me in the next day and he said, Joe, I want you to be the offensive coordinator. And two years later, I was the head coach of the Washington Redskins. Oh, Lord! Oh. Was that almost the game breaker? That very, was almost very close. A touchdown. And number 58, Tim Bocamper, came very, very close to an interception for a touchdown. Joe Bosman with a heads-up play. My goodness. I got my job with the Washington Redskins, and here I have a three-year contract. And, man, I said, uh, well, you know, I could get fired here. So, you know, I wasn't going to put my faith in God. I was going to put my faith. I'm, I'm going to make some money. And so I jumped out and uh, made a financial investment over the top of my wife's <laughs> best opinion. Boy, I tell you, she's a lot smarter than I am. I figured that out. But anyway, I found a way to make her say yes. You know, guys, do we sometimes do that? Or sometimes the ladies make their husbands find a way to say yes. And so I got in this investment in Oklahoma, and it was a land deal, and I got in a partnership, and uh, this thing's rolling along, and hey, I was going to be a passive investor, and I was going to make all this money. Instead of just trusting God and coaching football, I was going to get rich in real estate. And, you know, I don't think I'm uh, an egotist uh, about football because I'm always knowing somebody's around the corner ready to knock our block off. But in business world, I think I was kind of a, somebody that thought he kind of had this thing all worked out. Got in this investment. It goes about two years, and all of a sudden I started getting late notices one year right before the football season started uh, on some payments. I went, well, hey, what's going on here, you know? And so I sent a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Don Meredith, who's very close to me. He's here tonight. And... Uh, uh, I sent him down there, not the football, Don Meredith. He had a background in business. I said, Don, go down there and see if you can figure out what the deal is. He went down there and spent 64 days in Oklahoma trying to work on this problem and kind of, I think, hiding some of it from me. Well, I just coached the season. I said, hey, I can't worry about this. I'm going to coach the season. And so after the season's over with, I beat it down to Oklahoma. And when I sat down the first time with the attorneys, there were nine banks involved and it was way over a million dollars in debt, and uh, the interest alone was like $30,000 a month. I was bankrupt. Now, I can remember the night that I figured all that out, and I got on my knees in a bed, uh, right next to a bed in a motel room in Norman, Oklahoma, and I said, God, I said, I am bankrupt. 
There's no question about it. But I said, uh, and I'm willing to go through this if this is what you want me to do, but you know, I don't feel like I should file for bankruptcy. I feel like I have an obligation to these banks and to these people, and I'd like to work this out. And I'm just praying to you and saying, this is the biggest mess in the world. Only you could straighten this out. And do you know I went to all nine of those banks. They all worked out something with me. And do you know what's a bigger miracle than that? Not a one of them let out one peep to the press or anything else. All it would have taken is somebody working in any of those banks to said one thing. And hey, Joe Gibbs, the coach of the Washington Redskins, that would have been all over USA Today. They'd have had a ball with that, wouldn't they? And so, man, I tell you, it was miraculous. And do you know that I learned so many things about myself and my wife? Man, I tell you, that Pat stood up for me during that process. And my kids, I'd ordered one of them a car. Can you imagine what that's like getting a car, a brand new car? I had my son go and tell my wife, said, listen, you tell dad I don't need that car. I learned, out, I learned some things that I never would have learned about my wife, my family, myself during that financial crisis. Now, the point is this. The world will tell you you've got to win in all those things. But I'm here to tell you, God will be as real and work in those down times and adversity and he'll mold you and make you and work through those processes. Hey, we don't want to miss those things. Can I tell you this? That is one of the most cherished times in my life. Now, I didn't like it when I was going through it. But I'm going to tell you, I learned so many things. Man, I wrote down 15 things I learned from that experience. See what I'm saying? The world says, hey, you've got to win in everything. And yet, we all know you're not going to win in everything. There's going to be tough relationships. And there's going to be things that happen to you and in the business world and in your personal life. And isn't it great to know, hey, no matter what I do, it seems like, and how bad I can mess it up, God will love me through all of it. And I'll wind up getting stronger and stronger and stronger as he molds me and makes me. So maybe some of you have uh, had some of those feelings that I had and have been second-guessing about some things in your life. Maybe you're battling adversity in some way. Maybe uh, you could be having a problem with your finances. You could be having a problem in, in some way uh, physically. Or maybe you could uh, be battling some kind of an addiction. And maybe you need help through some of those things. Maybe some of you need to rededic rededicate your life as I did in 1972. And then the real exciting thing is maybe there's some of you here that want to make a personal a relationship and a commitment to Jesus Christ. And you want that and need that in your life. So that's my hope. By me sharing uh, some of those personal things with you and kind of sharing what's been going on in my life, you either have to look at that and say, hey, Joe's kidding me. He's not telling me the truth. Or God, if God can do that for him, meaning me, this isn't a lot to work with. Think what he can do for you. Man, he put Adam and Eve here, and he loved them so much, he gave them freedom of choice. And he put them in a garden of Eden, and he said, this thing's going to be perfect. All you have to do is just stay with me. But they didn't want to do that. He gave them freedom of choice. He could have made them as robots now, but he loved them too much for that. Many times I want to take my kids and lock them away in a room because I don't want them to get out and make mistakes. But see, if you love them enough, you've got to let them go. You've got to give them freedom of choice. God did that to Adam and Eve. They sinned. And at that point, when they sinned, everything that's evil entered the world. God, in his infinite wisdom, then said, hey, listen, there's only one way to get man back. That's to send my son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Lived a perfect life, was crucified, arose, went back to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God. And he's our way back to God. Man, isn't that, isn't that a fantastic story? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you realize well, how great that is? I mean, I was, I was sensed right here in Pastor, his sons. I'm going to tell you, this guy loves these two boys. I could sense that in him just like that. Hey, I love my two. I know you love your children. Can you imagine what it would be to give one of those up? And God did that for us. I tell you, that gift, and, and when I put those things together in my life, I was nine years old. I said, hey, I'm not a mistake. Uh, the world is proof that God exists. This Bible is proof. The love of my mother, my grandmother, 
And then when I found out how much God loved me, man, I tell you, at nine years old, I got up and took, forward, took off forward in church, and here's what I said. I said, God, I know you're there. I know you made me. I know you love me, and I want to give you my life. I want to close now with just a simple prayer, and this prayer is going to be just a, a little simple sinner's prayer that God says this. He says, if you pray this prayer, just to yourself, wherever you are there tonight, and you mean it, and you ask him to come into your life, and you would like to have a personal relationship with him, he's promised that he'll do that. And so I want to close now with that little prayer, if we just all bow our heads. <clears throat> Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. I know that he arose and is sitting at your right hand now. And I want to have a personal relationship with you. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life and live with me forever. And I thank you for the promise that you've made and that you're going to do that. And I believe it in your son's name, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want to congratulate you on the greatest decision you've ever made. There's another step I'd like you to take, though. If you would just write the address that you're going to see on the screen or call the phone number that you're going to see on the screen, we'd like to send you some more information. And again, I want to thank you for being a part of this video.